LA Virtual Info Session. Um, we're normally expecting to start right at five o'clock, but I know there's a couple more folks that are registered that are not here with us yet. So we might just wait another minute. Um, and then uh, I can introduce you all to the program, talk a little bit about what the Master of Liberal Arts offers, why it might be an interesting program for you, and then we can take some questions during the Q&A. Um, Zoom meeting is a great platform, except for the fact that every time we go on, they change something. And so they've uh, apparently, uh, de the default now is to not use the chat. So normally we would have a chat option where you could type questions in as we go and we can send you links back and things like that. Um, that's not happening. So what we'll do is after I go through the slides, um, and I'll start that in just a couple of minutes, um, we'll have some Q and A. You can ask your questions then. Um, I'll unmute everybody and uh, we can have a nice little conversation about um, the kind of things you're trying to accomplish uh, in terms of your pursuit of the Master of Liberal Arts. Okay, so we'll get started in just a minute. Thanks. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, what I'm gonna do is uh, momentarily unmute you all so we can all introduce ourselves, if that's okay. Um, and then we will get rolling. Hi again, I'm Chris Pastor, I'm the director of the Master of Liberal Arts Program. Um, I also have a colleague, Amy Mulhern, who's here from LPS Admissions and Recruitment. So she will help me answer questions. Uh, she also would be a good point of contact for future reference when you uh, do move forward and decide if you want to apply or learn more about the program. And um, we're going to have some fun telling you a little bit about Master of Liberal Arts. Um, so why don't you all take it a uh, minute to just say hi, tell us who you are and um, maybe why you're interested in the MLA, and then I'll go through the slideshow. Sure, I can begin. Sure. Um, so my name is Isadora. I also go by Izzy, whatever um, is easier. Um, so I just finished my undergraduate here in Toronto at Ryerson University. Um, it was a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Industries with a focus in media, business, and communications. Um, while I was in my undergrad, I kind of started developing a real interest for nonprofit organizations and working with queer communities. So now that I finished my degree, uh, which had a strong emphasis on marketing practices, I want to learn how I can kind of synthesize that now with a lot of my work experience as well. And that's kind of where I'm going from here and why I'm interested in pursuing my Master of Liberal Arts. Super, thanks Izzy. Okay. Um, who wants to go next? Ilya? William, Elliot, you wanna tell us about why you're interested in the MLA? Sure, I can go next. This is sure. Elliot. Hi Elliot. Uh, hello, how are you? Thanks for uh, taking the time. Sure. Uh, so my name's Elliot. Uh, I live in the Washington DC area. Uh, graduated from undergrad uh, approximately 10 years ago and I've been doing work as a data scientist since mm -hmm. then. 
Um, I studied economics uh, and philosophy and literature. Um, and I've sort of always had uh, an interdisciplinary bent uh, okay. to my interests. Um, and so during my professional life have continued to very avidly read poetry, philosophy, literature, uh, as well as pretty much anything else and get my hands on. Um, so I have some, some interests that uh, I'd like to narrow down into, you okay. know, a capstone type of project. So right. hoping that, um, that the MLA program is the, the right program for me. Okay, super. William, Ilya? Anybody want to share? Okay, why don't we go on and I'll start uh, giving you an overview of the program and how we fit into Penn. I just muted everybody. Um, and um, I'll share a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here with the Master of Liberal Arts and let you know a little bit more about the program. Um, so welcome to the Penn School of Arts and Sciences, LPS and the MLA. Uh, Penn's a big operation, as most of you know, really a uh, large, powerful research one institution. Um, it consists of 12 schools. We are part of the School of Arts and Sciences, which is kind of the beating heart of the university. It's the first school founded, um, you know, basically several hundred years ago by Benjamin Franklin and uh, colleagues. And we are one of three divisions, liberal professional studies in SAS. Um, so liberal professional studies is one of three with the college, um, which is the full-time undergrads and the graduate arts and sciences division. We're sort of the continuing ed division that is sort of innovative, um, flexible, more dynamic, um, and allows a lot of students to do things part-time, which is not um, generally typical in terms of access and opportunity in Ivy League institution. And the MLA is a great program, super flexible, really great for self-motivating students who are trying to do something interdisciplinary, unique, personal, uh, whether it's for enrichment, for academic development, for professional development, or any of those things. It can really push you in a lot of new directions, and it's a really fun um, program that's been around for 26 years now. First graduates, I think, were in 1993. Um, and uh, we've had something in the neighborhood of 900 or 1,000 students at this point go through the degree, um, all doing something unique and individual. Um, some of the key things to remember about the MLA are how the program is sort of shaped writ large. It's a nine course unit program. Penn, in its infinite wisdom, does not use credits the way many schools do, so it's not three or four credits and credit hours. The equivalent of a three or four credit course at a regular uh, Carnegie evaluated Middle States accredited university is a course unit at Penn. So I teach art history. If I teach an art history seminar on El Greco and modern art, it's one course unit, sort of the equivalent of four credits. You need to do nine graduate level course units. That normally is eight classes and a capstone as your ninth course unit, right? So that totals nine. Um, you can do it full-time, part-time. You can do it on campus. You can do some online coursework. You can mix and match. You don't lock yourself in. If you apply to do full-time and you get a great job and you want to go back to part-time, that's cool and vice versa. So we're really um, in, uh, hoping that you'll take advantage of embrace the idea. This is not flexible just academically in terms of interdisciplinary create your own major grad program. It's also flexible from a logistics point of view. You as a student develop your own unique individualized course of study, right? So those 900 or so graduates, they all did something different. Even if their concentration sounds similar to someone else's, they will have taken eight different courses because grad courses are different every term. Faculty keep changing their interests, keep changing what they want to teach, um, and you as students get a chance to be part of that growth in all these different disciplines. You create a concentration based on the courses that you find in the departments and disciplines that you're interested in, also in places across Penn and the other schools, the professional schools um, outside the School of Arts and Sciences, and create that theme or concentration that best suits your interests and maybe helps you move forward professionally or academically. And then you try and write a capstone that sort of nests uh, inside that concentration area. But again, it will be distinct and, and, and unique to you. Um, it's also a great opportunity because using those different courses in those different areas as you build that concentration, you explore different ways of approaching research, of developing um, you know, an agenda and figuring out ways to explore and problem solve and answer questions. And then you get to deploy all those different disciplinary skills that you learn in the service of answering the major question you develop for your capstone as your final project that you then write and have approved in your last term um, by two faculty readers. Now, why would you do an MLA versus an MA in English or an MBA in finance or a master's in higher ed? One reason is that 
it's interdisciplinary and it's flexible and it's dynamic and it gives you a lot of a wealth of opportunities. So as Elliot said, as Dor said, they had a lot of different backgrounds and areas of study they explored in undergrad and professionally, and they want to try and pull some of them together and maybe experiment a little bit. MLA lets you do that. It does allow you to help develop yourself personally and professionally for career advancement. Um, we did a survey years ago. Basically, most students said 100% satisfaction from an intellectual enrichment point of view. And of those, 93% of them said it helped them professionally. They got raises, they got new jobs, they got more confidence, they improved critical thinking and professional communication skills. So it really did help, even though they did not do a professional degree. It can help you with career transition as well. It might make you better um, prepared to move from one zone to another. I had a student and advisee who was an environmental engineer, and she's pursued the MLA sort of for fun outside of work. And once she got going, she got really excited in, um, in the liberal arts and the humanities and ended up leaving her industry and pursuing a PhD in history of art and moving forward into a faculty career. So that was kind of a fun uh, and unusual development. It wasn't what she projected, but it was really worthwhile. Had another student who came in thinking he was gonna go to med school. He was working in the labs after having been pre-med, took a class and found in a pro seminar in religion and public life. And next thing you know, by the time he finished, um, he applied and was admitted to a PhD program in religious studies and moved that way professionally. So it's, it's a fun way to find the path that's right for you. While you're here, you can network with other students, peers, faculty, administrators, and other folks here at this really big, giant, um, but kind of fascinating home, which is Penn. Um, I've been here at Penn now, I guess, 27 years. Uh, so I'm just past the halfway mark. I'm almost halfway. I've been at Penn probably more than I haven't been at Penn in my life. So it's a, cool, a really cool place, but it's complicated and, and busy. Um, but it's a great place to meet people who will have a lot of common interests that will also help you develop yourself um, as you grow in the program beyond the academics. As I said, we're really flexible in terms of time frame, part-time, full-time options. We also don't force you to take a course every term. You need to be active one course a year to stay go, uh, to move forward in the program. And we're one of the last graduate programs at Penn that does not have an official time to degree clock. So if it works better for you to do this slowly and methodically and have that complement what you do in your personal life and your professional life, that's okay. It's a great professional credential in the process. While you're having fun, you're doing something that's unique and individualized, you still end up with a master's from Penn. Um, that's the kind of thing that can really be uh, very helpful the next time you're out on the job market. And you can do that all in a place that has the academic rigor and the challenge of an Ivy League institution, um, which is what we're all about here. You also have the tremendous in, uh, resources of a, a research institution here at your fingertips, whether it's online or whether it's in person. Incredible library system, faculty at 12 different schools who have a wealth of backgrounds, students that come from all over the world coming to Penn to share ideas, and it's a great place to bounce around and uh, really just soak it all up. In the MLA, you get to challenge yourself and explore all across the liberal arts. SAS has 26 departments, 22 interdisciplinary programs, and counting. There are some uh, that, that come in every year. Uh, I think they're now exploring things as a minor in psychoanalytic studies, which didn't exist a couple of years ago. So every time we turn around, there's another area of study that our faculty are really building as on the fly. Um, so we offer a wide range of graduate opportunities across all those departments and programs in SAS. And the folks on the faculty are outstanding teachers that really want to come into a seminar room, want to come into a classroom and work with you as grad students to grow the discipline. As grad students, you're not just absorbing information the way you did as undergrad, you're actually giving back. You're pushing things forward um, and you're really gonna help faculty members um, develop their next book, develop their next class and really grow their discipline. So that's a really rewarding and, and fascinating and, and, and quite frankly, fun proposition. While you're here, you develop your own concentration. You can also pursue some certificates that exist in the School of Arts and Sciences that range from urban studies, cinema and media studies, gender studies, to global studies and um, ancient, um, ancient, ancient studies. So there's a lot of interesting things um, and even some things that are really uh, rare and aren't offered other places either at Penn and elsewhere, like the Cultural Heritage Management Program we offer with some partners at the Penn Museum. Um, and then at the end, when you develop that capstone as your uh, final research project or creative uh, paper, you're basically doing some uh, final work that allows you to deploy these strategies you developed in your coursework and, and really do that um, 
add that final piece to the puzzle and, and have a really great uh, final project that can be really uh, be an excellent takeaway uh, for you for figuring out where you're gonna go next. I'm just showing you a, a range of some concentrations that we had um, a couple of springs ago when a group of students finished up. These were the kinds of things they did. If you look down this list, you'll see that there's a couple things that are, okay, have not any acquaintance or more than one student that did global studies. Um, some of the folks that involved global issues in their subject matter, but there also were folks who did film and media production, people who did gendered storytelling and theory and, and writing literature and gender. So there's a real range of possibility because of the hundreds of courses that are offered at the graduate level in the School of Arts and Sciences and the additional hundreds of courses offered at each professional school here at Penn that you have access to. The MLA roster, which is evening courses for our program is smaller, 17, 18 courses each fall and spring, maybe 14 or 15 in the summer. And that's important because there's some students who can really work full time and do have a limited access and flexibility so they can do more evening courses. Um, but what we do try to do is make sure that there uh, are not, there's a range of topic areas even in our smaller evening roster. The capstone is also a, a really fun uh, way to finish off this interdisciplinary journey that you uh, do when you're in um, and pursuing the MLA. One of the options for capstones is to develop a paper that's totally new or to grow something that you developed in a class or two and figure out how to push them forward into a, a rather larger research project. A student that I work with, Brad Richards, um, did a really great project a couple years ago called Culture for Sale. Um, it was on Thomas Aiken's Gross Clinic. And one of the things that Brad did was he didn't really want to do a straight art history paper. He had a background in finance and business um, and then started working in, um, in development here at the university after he uh, moved out of his uh, company. He worked in a, a large chemical company for many years. Um, and in his paper, what he decided to do was address the conundrum and quite frankly, scandal um, that occurred when Jefferson University discovered that it had an extremely valuable painting by Thomas Aikens called the Gross Clinic of one of their founding um, research scholars in um, surgical medicine. And um, Dr. Gross, his portrait had hung in one of the faculty rooms for many years. And I guess after, um, at some point in the 1990s, Jefferson University realized this painting was worth upwards of 80 to $90 million. And they realized that their mission as a teaching medical institution um, meant that they could potentially deploy those resources better if they could find a buyer for that painting. And they did have a buyer. It was um, one of the heirs to the um, Walmart um, fortune, one of the Waltons, who opened a museum out in um, Arkansas called Crystal Bridges. And her advisor, a faculty member from Princeton, recommended that she buy the Gross Clinic as a centerpiece of her new uh, collection of American masters. When the sale was announced, um, this piece of our cultural heritage here in Philadelphia was, um, was going to be relocated, moved away, torn away. Jefferson alumni were upset because this was part of their school's identity, um, but also the cultural community here in Philadelphia was stunned by the likelihood that Aikens, who was a Philadelphian, who was a leading fa a faculty member at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts um, for much of his career, and central to the development of modern painting um, was sort of one of our cultural icons. And this painting was a central piece of, um, associated with the heritage of Philadelphia. So in this paper, Brad explored the idea of cultural heritage, of art as a commodity within the global marketplace, of um, artistic style and development. And it was a really fascinating opportunity to blend a whole bunch of different things coming from different areas. So when you're talking about how to address ideas that might have something to do with communication and creativity, but also maybe marketing and finance. This is an example of marrying the idea of understanding global commodities, right? And understanding finance and understanding, um, let's just say institutional uh, demands, like the kind of things that Jefferson University was faced with. And what happens when that bumps into another part of the world of culture that's for most of us not really associated with dollars and cents. Right? But in this case, that painting was. Um, so he explored that and I thought it was a really fun project. Um, and, uh, and you can still see that painting in Philadelphia today because Jefferson gave the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, the right um, to match the offer if they can come up with enough donors to spend as much money as um, Mrs. Walton was gonna pay. So they found donors in a partnership with the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and they bought it as a joint 
uh, painted painting now in the collections of both museums and it rotates between the two collections. So you can still see it if you come here next year to do the MLA. Um, Itian Sun, who was here from China, was really interested in um, new media, new communication tools, and how they were impacting global relationships. And one of the things that she dug into was the idea of uh, microblocks and the U.S. Embassy's use of these uh, to explain information to visa seekers, people working um, and hoping to do business in the United States, um, foreign nationals trying to figure out what their options were, and how the U.S. embassies were trying to figure out the best way to reach people on their personal devices, particularly in circumstances when there may be limited access to some communications and also restricted communications, as you think of places like China and all that kind of stuff where they have um, limits on which search engines you can use and all that sort of thing. And this was kind of fun because it talked about changing technology, talking about communication, they talked about global politics and diplomacy and looked at these sort of historically, but also in a modern case study realm. And so this fit into her global studies concentration and let her deploy things she learned from a screenwriting course, um, a course on cultural diversity and global connections, a course on system and design thinking, and explore this idea of how does a longstanding communication process that's baked into diplomacy and the operation of an embassy and a consulate to be the outward face for um, a nation, to others trying to come to that country for a variety of purposes, maybe from including education, um, and how they could use new ideas um, in social media like blogs and figure out the way to deploy those technologies. Um, Laura Grico um, did a really great project um, when she was here. During her course of study, she would take a course that she thought was relevant to her work in admissions at, at, in higher ed, one term, and the next term she would take a course that was more fun for her, where she could let her hair down and explore things from in the humanities, including creative writing. And so she had fun bouncing back and forth. It was kind of a bipolar program of study. Um, but when she reached her eighth course, we sat down and tried to decide what was the best way for her to close this out with her capstone. Um, and she had two projects. Again, one that was really relevant to a sort of the equivalent of a white paper for some aspect of understanding college age populations and how this um, helped admissions officers make decisions to build a class. And the other was going to build on something that she did um, in, in an anthropology course um, that she took on uh, food, culture, and society. And this was a sort of tour of her family history through the dispersal of her grandmother's recipes that talked a lot about their family ancestry, their cultural history, and what bonded them together as a family. So as she said, as the title says, it was called Eating the Family Tree, a Genealogical Investigation. And it was really fun for her because it was a paper that she would, if she finished the program and did something that was work-related, she would never do this creative project, but she was always going to develop more and more skills as an admissions um, manager and admissions director later in her career. So we took the opportunity and I talked her into it, a little bit of arm twisting here in my office, to do the fun project that really allowed her to write something that was both personal and poignant for her family um, in terms of exploring identity, but at the same time also allow her to stretch those creative muscles in this final capstone. And, and it really, as you can see, spun off of the, the range of courses she did that were both, let's say, toolkit courses for her career in nonprofit higher ed administration, but also things that were really valuable in understanding how we communicate, how we become an, a part of a community, how we build and shape that community for that family. We offer, as I said, a, a pretty interesting and, and fairly diverse MLA roster each term. We don't offer hundreds of courses ourselves. We might offer 15, 16, 17, or 18, depending on um, budget and faculty interest in any given term. Uh, for students that want to take night courses, we try to have three or four online courses each term as well. Um, there are other evening graduate courses, but then there's also the range of courses offered by all the PhD programs, MA programs and SAS, and also grad programs in the other schools. But some of the courses that we offer, uh, as you say, well, are sort of good at, let's say, an introduction to the kind of things that SAS does. So Vlad Todorov here is a filmmaker, um, offers some courses in Russian Eastern European studies. And this summer, he'll be doing a course on Russian history and film that will be an online course. He'll do through Zoom like this and have seminar discussions, film um, sessions, uh, blog posting, and chat rooms and discussion groups 
um, about this way of understanding Russian history through the media of film, which certainly the Russians deployed a lot um, for a lot of propaganda purposes, but also as an interesting way to help us better understand their cultural paradigm, if you will. Um, Emily Steiner, professor in the English department, is offering a course she's calling Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and Other Stories. Um, she's super, uh, you know, witty, clever, funny, arch, um, excellent social media user, has a great Instagram um, posts and uh, blogs about uh, Pierce the Plowman and other great um, rare books that are held in the Penn collections. Um, but this would be a great chance for everybody to think about that great comedic uh, and, and let's say prurient and, and sort of arch um, storyteller Chaucer himself. Um, you don't need to know any early middle English to work your way through this, um, but uh, it'd be a good way to think a lot about the rise of this, this um, the novel out of the storytelling genre um, and that Chaucer pioneered. Um, Natalie Shively in history department is going to offer a course called Race, Gender, and Medicine. Um, this is going to be a new course for us. We haven't offered it before. And I think it'll be really interesting for us to consider, especially in light of a lot of the conversations about healthcare as a human right, um, the best ways to deliver healthcare to more people, and who um, is eligible for healthcare, and who has more access, and how do politicians and how do individuals feel about that. Um, we have a lot of issues with who gets appropriate treatment. Um, and I think Natalie's course is going to introduce some ideas about how that all folds in to um, the delivery of healthcare, the development of medical sciences, uh, and the influence of race and gender on who gets healthcare and how much it costs and why. After the MLA, a lot of folks go on to do some really great things. As I mentioned, some students have pursued PhDs and gone on to teach. Um, we've had other students go on to you know, law school and other professional programs, um, including the Wharton Finance Program and the Annenberg PhD program here at Penn. Um, we've had a lot of folks change careers, as I mentioned, um, but also grow in their own profession from the skills that they explore here in their coursework. Uh, but also a lot of them tell us that it was really just an enriching experience that confirmed themselves as lifelong learners, that let them get back in the classroom, that let them try new things, that let them maybe study things that they didn't do as undergrad. So say you went to undergrad and did accounting and finance, you could come here and do an MLA and talk about literature and communication, take courses in Shakespeare and Chaucer and things like that. And finally do some of the fun courses that you didn't do when you were doing a practical college degree uh, some years back to make sure that you could put food on the table, let's say. As far as admissions go, it's pretty straightforward. Our um, application is all online. Uh, we use the college net. I don't know what the portal tells you the program is when you log in, but you go to our website, click on apply, um, and off you go. The application requirements are some essays, two letters of reference. They can be academic or professional letters of reference, a resume, transcripts from all of your post-secondary institutions, including like summer programs and things like that, and the application fee. We admit year round, so we admit in spring term for January, summer term for term classes starting in March, and fall term for classes starting in late August. Usually the deadline is somewhere around a month and a half before the start of term, but we're usually open a year in advance. So right now you can apply for summer, fall, and spring of 2021 right now. And as soon as your application is complete, I'll do the preview, we'll set up a phone interview, then we'll get you evaluated by our internal MLA committee and then off to our MLA faculty committee. And you start to finish from complete to review, you might know within a month. So you could apply now for next year and, and set your schedule up. So as I said, it's rolling. Um, we do it as quickly and efficiently as possible to make sure that our faculty and our admissions review committee has a good chance to make sure that you're up to the task, um, that you'll be successful here in graduate work um, and that you'll have, and we can make that opportunity um, available to you. You can check our website, LPS. Um, you can Google Penn LPS. You can Google Penn MLA. Any of those things now will probably bring us all up. Um, but the web link is also here on the slideshow. SASUPenn.edu slash LPS. The financials. Um, right now, 1920 tuition and fees are 53.70 per course unit. Usually we have anywhere between a three and a four percent increase every year annually. Um, I don't know if that's projected for 2021 yet or not. Um, there is financial aid available in terms of loans, subsidized student loans for students doing two course units or more per term. Full-time course study is three or four course units. That's required for an international student. But as I said, most of our students, 90% are part-time. Um, but we also calculate full-time tuition 
per course. There's no set term tuition that, like in many programs where it doesn't matter how many courses you take, if you're full-time, you pay a flat rate. We don't do that. We charge, um, charge per course. There are no scholarships um, or assistantships available to MLA students, although some MLA MITs who come full-time have um, gotten positions as residents or um, assistants in the college houses, and that give, um, works for room and board. Um, other students have come um, by pursuing outside funding and scholarships from a range of programs. Uh, so there are a lot of programs out there if you search graduate funding um, that may have more to do with who you are as a student and what subject you want to take as opposed to the degree you're applying for. So I would recommend researching all that. But it's a great program for people working full time who want to take one course a term, do a grad degree here at Penn over say, three years without rushing um, and just sort of pay as you go, budget wisely, um, and uh, end up with a great rich Ivy League graduate student experience. It's going to be valuable to you academically and professionally, but you know, don't jump in and, and borrow a lot of money. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Okay, so the main thing now is I'd like to answer any questions you have about uh, the MLA and whether it work, might work for you. So what I'm going to do is uh, unmute all of you folks um, and then let's, uh, you can ask questions and this way everybody else can also hear all of your answers. So fire away. Um, I have a question. Sure. So I was just wondering, I like everything I've heard. It sounds amazing, of course. Um, but I wanted to know what you think is one aspect of the program that you're currently working on improving and how you're going about doing okay. that. Yes, okay. I agree. It's pretty, it's kind of amazing to imagine you can create your own major at the graduate level here at Penn. A lot of people can't believe this program exists. MLA is, is a, a program in the graduate level studies and there is an or, there are national organization, I'm the vice president of it now for the next year, um, of similar programs in graduate level studies. But ours is really wide open, which is really nice. But the one thing that we, I would say, is sort of a handicap that we're trying to um, improve is access, right? So we do offer pretty broad access because we're not a cohort-based program. We allow part-time study. We let students take full uh, part-time evening courses and all that kind of stuff. What I'd like to do is also make it possible for more students to do this program without having to come to campus every term or regularly. Mm -hmm. We've made some small gains in getting two or three or four online courses for a summer term or a fall term, but I haven't really been able to get enough resources to add two more courses each term, to go to from four to six, and then go from six to eight, and eventually allow the program to be something that can be much more uh, diverse in terms of offerings for students who can't get to Penn, can't get to West Philadelphia every Wednesday for the next three years, right, to do one course a term. Um, we have had some students do much of their program online, and they have to be really light on their feet. They have to explore and find online courses in other departments and programs outside the off the MLA roster but I had a student finish up after she got transferred to London another fellow had to move to Spain for family reasons he finished up over the next three years but it was let's just say a, a tricky for them to figure out how to make the classes that we could offer online relevant to their concentration now many smart clever graduate students which I'm hoping you all will be could parachute into any course and write a paper that's relevant to your own interest, no matter what the course is called. But it's not quite the same as us being able to find more courses that are appealing to you from the get-go and make them available. So one thing we're trying to do and answer your question is to get more um, resources so we can offer more online courses. Okay. I don't know how I'm gonna get there, but I'm trying. Definitely, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? So, so question about the rec letters, you said yeah. academic and professional accepted. What are you looking for in those? And, um, you know, if, if they're academic and or professional, is there, you know, any weighting given, given on either no. side? See, as you said, you're, you're, you've been working 10 years, right? That's right. You do econ, you do data science. If you get an academic reference from a professor you had in school 12 years ago, they might remember you fondly and say great things about you as a student. Um, but you might also have a boss or a colleague you work with wants to write you a reference that will tell me more about who you are now as a mature 
self-motivated, deadline-driven person who's light on their feet. What I'm really doing is trying to make sure that I get enough information then so that, that I can share with our review committee that lets us be holistic in reviewing your application because we want to know not so much can you study something you already studied before or that you use every day in work. This is not meant to be more of what you've done. This might be you going, you going out on a limb. So I want people to tell me that you are up to the challenge. But also what I need your letters of reference to tell me, I need you and your resume and you and your academic transcripts and you and your essays to tell me is that you're going to drive this thing and I'm just going to have to be the backseat driver, right? Because you guys all want to do totally different things in the MLA. So I can't tell you what to take. I can tell you how the courses you want to do may come together into something and give you guidance, feedback, advisement, and sort of be a sounding board, right? So I help you brainstorm your way forward to a concentration, to a capstone, but you are the driver and I'm the backseat driver, right? So I want your letters of reference, whether they're academic or professional, to give me a snapshot, a look at um, what that person thinks are some of your strongest traits. And if those traits are self-motivated, um, person who's going to turn over every rock to find the information they need, that's what I want to hear. But it doesn't matter if it's a professor you had or a colleague or a boss. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Super. Anything else? I have a question about sure. um, the capstone project. Okay. So um, I know you mentioned, of course, there's a lot of flexibility and right. there aren't really any set guidelines that we need to follow. Um, but I was wondering, like in terms of if we were to get admitted into the program and kind of trying to weave our way through all the different yep. options, yeah. Um, how is it that at the end of the program, we would kind of, I guess, like pull in different aspects of all the different courses we took? I know you mentioned, you know, um, the faculty works a lot with the students to help them kind mm -hmm. of realize that. But I'm just wondering, you know, is there, for instance, since I'm trying to study um, kind of queer studies and okay. look into um, gender and sexuality, yep. would that mean that I would have to predominantly take courses within kind of those fields or how would that work? No, I would imagine that you're, you know, there's a lot of places you could go. There might be cinema studies courses mm -hmm. on queer uh, cinema, but there might also be an anthro course on, um, or an urban studies course that doesn't have anything to do with that aspect, but it's more about, um, you know, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And what you might do is explore in that neighborhood. You might take a course on that and that may help you think about um, self-segregation. Mm -hmm. and the influence of um, gentrification driven maybe by um, uh, queer buyers, right? And driving out local populations. So there's like a neighborhood here in Philadelphia and that was, that was the case, right? Yeah. So the courses you take may have nothing on to do with queer studies on the face of it, but they may help you explore aspects of identity. Even if in your paper for that class, you don't do anything that has anything to do with queer studies, and that mm -hmm. would be okay as well. You're just learning practices, approaches, disciplinary and methodological um, approaches to problem solving and developing a research agenda, and then you're going to deploy them yourself on your capstone. What you usually do is, as you take classes, you kind of find one or two or three faculty members that you like working with, and then see if their disciplinary expertise and their temperament and you all work together well, and that's where you go to find that team that's going to help you with your capstone. But the capstone is basically a final written piece. So this is a research paper. We've had folks that do creative things where they do poetry cycles or short stories or um, full novels, you know, and that sort of thing. And also a capstone does not have to draw from every class you took. It's not like an undergrad capstone in that regard. Um, it might be really closely related to just a handful of your courses or no specific course, but it may draw on some of the disciplines that you explored in your coursework. And that, that's, uh, in, that's distinct and individual to each student. Thank you, perfect. But we also have instances where students kind of take a lot of courses and try as I might to keep everybody on the same page and stay in communication. Um, they may just be picking courses that work for them that are all graduate, that doesn't, nothing raises a red flag, and they get to course seven or eight and they realize, oh, gee, I don't know what I want to do for my capstone. And they panic. But I will tell you, in 15 minutes here on the phone, 
on Skype or Zoom or in my office, I'll ask you some questions. I'll get you to start writing things down about what did you like about that course? What did you like about that course? What did that professor help you do? Um, and before you know it, in sort of mad kid scribbling, you actually will really be able to enunciate what your concentration was. And then I'll be able to say, what paper do you still want to write? What do you still want to learn while you're here? And that's your capstone. Mm -hmm. so, so I've had students come in and like, really like, oh my gosh, I'm, done. I'm registered for my eighth course. I don't know what I'm going to do next. How am I going to finish? And 15 minutes later, they have a capstone. They know who their readers are going to be and they walk out ready to go. Mm -hmm. And they were totally perplexed on the way in. But that's because in most cases, most students in the back of their mind are used to an academic program where everything is spelled out. We tell you what to take, when to take, in which order, and what it means for the next step, right? That's how undergrad and most grad programs are built. We're not that animal at all, right? But you, as a student, usually have some provisional rationale for every class you take, even if it's just because it sparks your interest when you read the title and course description. It connects to the other things you're doing and your general interests subconsciously. And you really sort of know that in all I do is usually try to facilitate, not really in a therapy fashion, more in an advisor student conversation about the academic outcomes that you were hoping to take away. And you know really why you took those courses. And ultimately that can be fleshed out into a capstone in very, very short order. Perfect, thank you. Super. Okay, guys, uh, have anything else you need to ask? You don't have to, that's okay. But if you do, anything does come up, go right to our website or call the main number, get my email address, send me a note. We can talk more about what you're trying to do. Um, I would normally put my email address up in the chat, but Zoom um, has somehow lost the chat option off the menu. So I'm gonna tell it to you slowly, right? Um, C Pastor, C-P-A-S-T-O-R-E, at upenn.edu. So C-P-A-S-T-O-R-E, at upenn.edu. Email me anytime. Um, tell me a little bit more about what you want to do. Uh, tell me about, go online, look at the MLA course roster for spring and summer. They're posted now. See if anything really excites you. And uh, then ask me questions and we'll try and figure out how to make this program uh, work for you. Uh, the one thing I did not mention, um, I must have gone past it, is that amongst your nine courses, you can take two outside School of Arts and Sciences as well. Most other liberal arts programs generally are more like great books or more narrow bandwidth um, opportunities. We actually would let you take a course in uh, um, marketing um, at Wharton if you can get a permit. Take a course at the School of Engineering in um, machine learning. So I've had folks do really interesting stuff where they've explored artificial intelligence and done cognitive science, psychology, um, philosophy, mathematics, and then take a course or two from engineering. Really kind of, you know, because math is a liberal art. Um, and, uh, you know, do things that you wouldn't think otherwise sort of fit in under the rubric of a master of arts program. So you can be pretty uh, flexible and dynamic. And if you are, this is the program for you. Amazing. Um, I just have one more question kind of building off of that. Go for it. So because I know for myself, I'd be an international student and there is the requirement, as you mentioned, um, taking three to four courses per semester. Yep. So how does that work if, um, let's say there's one specific course I want to take in the spring. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not really familiar with how, what the requirements are. Would it be a total of six to eight courses per year? And then I could kind of divide them up no, if there's one I particular. Do that. I think for international students, right? Uh, if you're not a green card holder or a permanent resident mm -hmm. or a U.S. citizen, I believe in your first term of study, you have to be full time. Okay. Even if you're, now, I don't know if that's true now if you don't come to the U.S., right? So if you want to take one course and there was an online course, mm -hmm. I think you could take one online course okay. before you come to campus. But you would have to double check with um, the, U the U.S. Um, visa policies for student visas yeah. now. Um, Penn International Student Scholar Services might have answers to that. Mm -hmm. um, consulate might. I don't know the exact rules. Um, I do know that if you come here as an international student and you're on campus, you're only allowed to take one online course amongst your three or four classes mm -hmm. in your first term. I also know if you're a national student and you were full-time, say you, you, say you apply and you were admitted in spring, you could take full-time, three courses. You can then take the summer off 
or be part-time, take just one course in the summer, okay. and then come back in the fall and be full-time again. So there's a little bit of flexibility in how it all works out. But I think in your first term, if you come to the U.S. and you are at Penn, you would have to be full-time. Okay. I believe you might be able to take just one course as an international student, but not if you're in residence. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive. Now, the other option, though, is three is full-time, but once admitted, you can apply for and request reduced course load. And oftentimes that's, that's um, primarily a case when students are overwhelmed because English is a second language. And so some mm -hmm. students then drop down to two, but I don't know if there would be any mechanism that you take just one class as an international student who needs to be full-time. Yeah. But you can certainly no, investigate I've, that. Yeah, I looked into that. Um, I saw that like the majority of cases, it's like medical reasons and things right. like that. So I don't think that would necessarily apply right. in this case, but I just wanted to see if there was leeway in terms of if there was a specific course I wanted to take that. My point of view, there's all kinds of leeway in terms of full and part-time for students, but we're, for international students, yeah. we're sort of bound by what um, you know, yeah. Penn policy is and how that relates to what the State Department and Department of Education uh, permits. Understood. Okay, but if it's something that you're not sure about, investigate, but also follow up, write me an email, remind me that this is a question you have and mm -hmm. I can try and see what I can help you find out. Um, but I, I, that's not my real bailiwick. So I, you know, as I said, we have maybe 10% of our students in a given term are full-time and most of those are international students. Yeah. Um, but I don't have cohort after cohort of 40, 50 international students every term coming in. So I've never been mm -hmm. forced to learn all the ins and outs of international yeah. education policy. So, Thank you. Anyway. So I'm not the best resource for that, sadly. <laughs> but I can try and help. Thank you. All right. Okay, folks, well, thanks for joining us. Um, as I said, feel free to email me anytime um, and uh, if you have other questions. Um, and hopefully you decide this works for you and you figure out a way to make it happen. Um, apply. I have enjoyed reading your applications and uh, interviewing you and working with you later. Thank thanks you. and have a great night. Thank you.